Welcome everyone to another Vival Pain Society social media live and this menopause sexology special, how the vagina and vulva are affected by menopause. Thank you for joining us. I'm Sharon Goldbear, Vival Pain Society trustee, therapist and pain science educator. As always, please do say hi in the comments if you're watching live. And of course you can comment too if you're watching the replay. Kay Thomas is in the background on Facebook. Uh, oh, I can see there's 20 of you already joining. Fantastic. Do say hi. Hi, Marion. Thanks for joining us. Today's guest is Dr. Angela Wright, GP, clinical sexologist and menopause specialist in North Yorkshire. She works as a partner at a medium-sized rural practice in Massam and also involved in the complex menopause clinic in Hull, treating menopause and PMDD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder and sexual issues. An affiliate of COSRIT, the College of Sexual and Relationship Therapists. She's a member of the Institute of Fossil Hacker Sexual Medicine the British Med Medical Society and the National Association for Premenstrual Syndromes, NAPS. She's very interested in all sexual dysfunction, but particularly women's hormonal issues focusing on menopause. Welcome, Dr. Angela Wright. Thank you for joining Hi, thank us. You. Thanks Hi. for having me. And also today we have my fellow trustee, Dr. Winston DeMello, who will be chatting with Dr. Angela Wright whilst I sneak off into the background to be in the comments box. Dr. Winston DeMello. Hi, Winston. Uh, hi, Sharon. Hi. Good evening to everyone. And welcome, Angela, to this uh, podcast. Thanks, Winston. So really looking forward to listening in the background on this one and as i say i'm going to slip off into the background into the comments box and i will be back a bit later on uh, to pick up on any questions that may be coming in we've already got 34 people watching and lots of comments coming in saying hi thank you everyone for joining us winston i'm going to hand over to you okay thank you sharon well good evening to everyone um i'm really excited about tonight because i've met uh, dr wright um, as part of my IPM training, which uh, uh, some of you may have listened to with our seminar leader, Dr. Kath White. And Dr. Wright always intrigues me because not only is, uh, is she a general practitioner, but she also is involved in the menopause and clinical sexology. So I'm really excited about uh, the two subjects because I know very little about it. And therefore, I'm, I'm just going to use this as an excuse to try and get as much information I can get off her <laughs> so that uh, our listeners uh, will benefit from it. So I'm going to start, Angela, by, by just asking you, just tell us a little bit about yourself. How did, how did you get involved in medicine and, and how did you get involved in, in clinical sexology? Um, getting involved in medicine is a is a long story, but the, the sort of brief version of it was that it was suggested to me in a careers interview. So they, uh, my dad suggested that it might not be something that I would manage to do. So I, um, I sort of set it up on myself to prove him wrong. Um, and then I've been a GP really since getting out of uh, medical school. I did my first couple of years in house jobs, um, went straight into general practice. And in my GP training jobs, I spent a bit of time in a hospice for uh, one of my GP jobs. Really enjoyed that um, and spent about 10 years. I, I did some extra training in hospice medicine and spent 10 years working alongside the GP work in hospice. And it's sort of an odd thing to lead you to clinical sexology but I think it was probably doing the kind of work where I was talking with you know, difficult conversations um, spending a bit of time looking at patients quite holistically rather than just looking at the, the medical model that I'd been taught at med school um, and so when my littlest I've got a, a child that's sort of seven I've got three kids but my youngest is seven and when he went back into school I was thinking of things that I might want to do a bit more training in and as a GP, you do loads of gynecology and I you know, fit coils. I see women um, after having babies all the way through their sort of reproductive life and menopause. And I just felt really unable to deal with a lot of the problems that they were bringing to me. Um, so if they had sexual pain or if they'd been exposed to, you know, history of sexual trauma, something like that, I just didn't have a service to refer them to. And I didn't know a great deal about it myself. So 
I sort of went off looking for things that might teach me about it um, and came across this this diploma in clinical sexology. Mm -hmm. So the kick, uh, so uh, where is the this diploma in clinical so this is um, the training that I did is um, based in Cambridge and it's there's only a few COSRA approved courses in the UK and it was one of those um, and it was the syllabus was the thing that really dragged me in. So it, it, it talks a lot about how we develop sexually and about relationships and things that can go wrong with sex. But it also teaches you about some of the forensics, about stuff that I didn't know about, like kink and paraphilias, um, about you know, sex offending. You get training about working with, with people who've got that sort of background, um, working with trauma and shame, just, just a huge broad sweep. And the more I did, the more interested I got in it. And I did lots of reading about it. Um, and you have to do, to do a therapeutic training, you have to do a lot of work on yourself. It's quite experiential. So I had to do personal therapy and talk and think about how my own sort of development. So in order for looking around at you know other books and things I could read on it, I found out about the European Society of Sexual Medicine who do an intensive school in Europe every couple of years to train doctors um, to, sort of, to take an exam and to get membership of, of the European Commission, of, or the European Committee, sorry, of sexual medicine. So I went across there, I did the exam, and I did all of it without necessarily thinking about what I was gonna do with it in the end. It was just really interesting. And when I got back into practice, um, the menopause bit came because I realized that the time that I was using it most in my practice was with women as they hit menopause. And it's such a huge transition for women that then I thought I should go and do some menopause training and got linked in with the British Menopause Society and, and went down that route. What intrigues me, um, Angela, is, is uh, when you look back over your career, before you got involved in this uh, subspecialty, and and you, you completed uh, two big subspecialty areas. When you go back to general practice, how have you changed? That's a really good question. I take longer. It's really hard to stick to 10 minutes now. Um, I think, and the biggest reason for that, I think, is there's a lot of psych psychology training in doing clinical sexology, because everybody that I was sat with um, training, there was I was the only doctor, the rest of the room were counselors. So you, I had to learn how to do CBT. I had to learn a lot about um, people's psychology and things like addiction and managing change. And, and now I have all that sort of knowledge. I find it really hard when I'm dealing with patients to sort of skim over the top. I want to, to really dig in and, and figure out what's going on and hear about their stories and things. So I think my colleagues would tell you I run late. That's the biggest change. And uh, as a result, you've, you've now um, got a separate specialist clinic um, in Hull. Tell us about that. So, that, so that's where I trained. So I went and trained um, with a lady called Tonya Wakoma in Hull and she was quite interested in the fact that I was um, I, I was doing the sexology and I had the psychosexual um, therapeutic side of things and I was doing my exams in Budapest at the time so studying for that and it ended up that I was running clinics and seeing lots of patients with sexual dysfunction problems um, and I think that they identified at the time that there was quite a gap in, in the service for that sort of thing. So she's been campaigning to get some funding um, to create a permanent post there, which has now gone through. So COVID sort of delayed things, um, but the post is now a permanent one and will be going forwards, hopefully in the next few months. We've had a gap over COVID where I've not been over in Hull and I've been doing most of so my work to, through the menopause clinic. Just to get an idea, um, in, in the UK, are there many uh, specialists like you? Um, I think I did a count and the, the FECSM, so the membership exam that I took, um, I think there's about 54 of us in the UK that have it. But it's the only people that can do it. It's general practitioners. You get some general practitioners. You get gynecologists, um, psychiatrists, urologists. So the people in the UK that have got this qualification, it's a mix of all those different specialties. I don't, I, I know of a few GPs. Um, I don't mm -hmm. know of any other medical, uh, any other menopause specialists that have got this qualification. I've got a colleague and a and friend called Angela Sharma that's done very similar training to me and she's about to sit her exam. So there'll be two of us, I think, in the UK. And we're going to set up, hopefully, um, a private clinic together to offer the service oh, a bit exciting. more. Yeah, we're doing a lot of work yeah, on the moment. Good. So I'm just trying to imagine you, you start off as a general practitioner and now you've got into this uh, specialist interest area. So yeah. 
In your specialist clinic, what would be the typical sort of patients you would see uh, in a in a in a session? What 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 are they? What are the common ones? So, I mean, it's it's a first and foremost, it's a menopause clinic, um, and it's mm-hmm. also seeing women that have you know any other reason that they might need to use HRT. So, we see women that have had uh, premature ovarian insufficiency. So, that's if you lose, if you go into menopause in your twenties or thirties, it's it's a different sort of ball game, really, with a lot more complicated risk. So, we see those women. Um, we see women that have got PMDD, so premenstrual dysphoric disorder, um, because one of the ways that we treat that sometimes is to effectively stop their hormone cycling and then sometimes replace back with HRT. There are some transgender patients um, and increasingly we'll be seeing people with sexual dysfunction. I think what was happening was that I was asking about sexual dysfunction or um, because women don't tend to bring it to you. They they, they often have something going on, but they won't always declare it or ask for help with it. Um, So Mm -hmm. I think we realised quite quickly that having that sort of specialist knowledge available was really helpful. So going forward, we should be taking referrals for that specifically. In your clinical sexology hat, what would be mm-hmm. the kind of patients you would see? So with I mean, most of the people that I see, you know, with the most females that I see, I see with sexual dysfunction around menopause. I mean, you do get some people postnatally okay. um, coming in after childbirth with problems, but the sort of the peak time that I, I would see women is in menopause. And it's often... The referral will often be about low libido or the woman will come in and say that she's got a problem with, you know, loss of sex drive. But if you dig in, it's often way more complicated than that. That's often the final common denominator that somebody's gone off having sex. But it it can be an arousal problem or issues with climax um, or pain, often, you know, something of all of those. Um, so I think a lot of the time in sexology, you know, we were taught with something called a biopsychosocial model. And the idea is Mm -hmm. you can't look at a patient in isolation. You can't just, you know, if you're looking at the bits and thinking that all you need to do is get the bits working, you're missing what's Mm -hmm. happening in the woman's mind, in her life, in her relationship. And all of that stuff comes into play when you're looking at sexual issues. Mm -hmm. And and, uh, that's become quite trendy now with with, uh, uh, clinicians being encouraged to look at patients more holistically, learning it from the palliative care world. Uh, mm. how, how difficult is it when, when you're trying to address all those different factors uh, uh, in, a, in a patient? Uh, do most of them realise that it's a lot more complicated than at first sight? Yeah, but I think I think all medical problems are really. I mean, with with the way that I was taught with um, sexology, especially when I did the ESSM training, was we almost look at sort of a chart, and you you need to work out what's going on in somebody's body, what's going on in somebody's mind, and then you look a bit more widely about what's happening in the home and at work and in their relationship. And and we try to look at it across time as well. So you look at you know what might have precipitated the problem, um, you know what what are the predisposing factors what's making it carry on and you do end up with a complicated plan but if all you do is give um you know if you just give a woman testosterone for example which is a hormone that can sometimes improve libido you won't always find it makes a difference if she's in a relationship with somebody where you know there's a lot of dysfunction in the relationship or if she's under a great deal of stress so I think that it's such an important way to look at people anyway, but particularly with problems like sex, I think, where you've got, you know, you're often having sex with somebody else in the first place. So your own health is not the only thing that impacts on it. I think there's good evidence that shows that women's sexual satisfaction scores are more impacted by partner health than it is by their own health. So all of that right. stuff is, right. is hugely important. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm showing my age here. Um, uh, when I was in training, atrophic vaginitis was uh, was the term used, uh, yeah. and now we we call it the GSM, the genital urinary uh, syndrome of the menopause. Can you elaborate on the connection between the genital system and the urinary system? You know, it's it's fascinating. Um, uh, you know, j- just to see that that combination and why the phrase GSM has got such a good. Uh, Way of, yeah, uh, I think describing things. I think that the problem with atrophic vaginitis was it really it, it sort of shrank down what was going on to to something that only looked at, at atrophy and looked at what was happening in the vagina and the tissue of the vagina and the vulva and the bladder. It's all derived from the same part of the fetus, so and it's all got estrogen receptors in it. So when you go into menopause, right. 
these tissues are all equally affected by the change in your circulating estrogen levels. So you, you don't just get problems in the vagina, you get, you know, the, ex, the external vulval skin um, is often quite affected by the lack of estrogen, but so is your bladder. I mean, your bladder is, um, it's known to to shrink. It's known to, um, that the receptors exist in the sphincter of the bladder as well. So that can get a bit weaker mm -hmm. and we see more people with overactive bladder or um, we get problems with our pelvic floor that gets weaker. So stress incontinence can be an issue. And I think if you only look at the atrophic vaginitis part of the picture, you miss a hell of a lot that might be going on and impacting on somebody's you know, sex life, for example. If you've got external skin changes that make you very sore on the outside or make you more prone to eczema or dermatitis or you know, skin condition called lichen sclerosis, if you've got problems with um, incontinence or um, we call it coital incontinence where when you get aroused or you're climaxing, you might lose a little bit of urine. Women don't report that stuff to you. Uh, you have to go digging and ask mm -hmm. about it. But all of it has the same kind of pathophysiology, the same underlying things are happening that are leading leading to this. Now you mentioned um, the estrogen receptor in, in in the in these various organs. So yeah. which leads me to my, my next uh, question: um, estrogen therapy or HRT. Uh, what are your sort of um, rules of thumb for its use in 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 that in that menopausal group that's a huge question i mean hrt partly you need to look at it as being systemic or topical so the systemic mm -hmm. hrt is looking at replacing um the, the sex hormones that that women have so actually that's estrogen and or progesterone mm -hmm. possibly with some testosterone and that's going across the whole of the body system and that's a fairly different thing from considering what we might do about GSM, which is to give back estrogen mm -hmm. or usually estrogen um, just into the vagina mm -hmm. or on the vulva. But it's a, you know, it's a hugely individualized decision. And I think what I see in clinic are a lot of women that are quite conscious of the fact that um, it increases the risk of breast cancer. And I think often have yeah. heard a lot in the media that's made them quite frightened of having HRT. So, so yeah. come in perhaps feeling like they shouldn't want it or they might they, they might be better doing this naturally. But there's not a huge yeah. amount of information that gets out to them about the consequences of not taking HRT and also the benefits that exist with HRT. I, I tend to say to women, you've, you've, you've got sort of... Um, the bit of taking HRT helps you with the symptoms of your menopause when you're going through the tr transition period of menopause and your hormones can be up and down and you've got lots of symptoms to worry about. But the other aspect of what it does is modify your risk in your post menopause years. And we didn't used to live into postmenopause years. I mean, 200 years ago, we didn't really have a post menopause, uh, post menopausal stage of life. And we're now having about a third of our lives post menopausally and hormone deprived. So I tend to think of it as being a really important point to sit down with women and talk about yeah. what's happening now, but also talk about what they want to happen in the next few decades. You know, do they want to be active? Do they want to be sexually active? How important is their sexuality to them? And to have a bit of a chat about risks and lifestyle changes and, and other things. Topical HRT is quite a different um, conversation for yeah. most women. Now the topical uh, estrogen is is very much a lower dose uh, than the system, the system yeah, systemic yeah. ones. Yeah. How long does the the uh, patient need to take the topical estrogen before they see the effects of it? Depends on the dose because it, it comes in different doses and formulations. But if you're taking right. a sort of a t a, the average um, dose that you need if you're going to try and improve sexual function is is above ten micrograms in in the dose, um, and that will normally take six to eight weeks to start to show an effect. I sometimes start women on a cream that's a bit stronger um, to try and sort okay. of you know, preload it and get, I think you lose, people lose faith in a therapy if it's not working. And it's quite, it's quite messy. It's quite annoying to have to think about using a cream or a pessary um, every night to begin with. And then we drop it down to, to just twice a week afterwards. So um, okay. there's, there are, there's good evidence that if you use a low dose one, you can use it safely lifelong or certainly for as long as you are struggling with symptoms. Okay. Now, the, the other thing that, that I find fascinating, you, you talked about the genitourinary uh, syndrome of menopause, but the menopause has huge other effects on the body. I was just thinking of cardiac and, and bone health. Does HR, going on HRT uh, help 
with those two organs, which are very critical. With with bone and, and, uh, and heart uh, health. health, yeah, absolutely. And, and um, cardiac health, yes. It's been good, it's been good. So I think. As I said to you before, you know, everybody worries about the risk that you get with HRT, but I think what's less understood mm -hmm. is the effect on the female body of not having estrogen. And estrogen is, is good mm -hmm. for us, you know, estrogen really benefits us. And, and when we're in our fertile years, our risk of heart disease is, is significantly lower than male risk of heart disease. And part of that is, or large amount of that is to do with the action of estrogen on the female body. And it has a lot of effects on our vascular system, um, including making it more difficult for, you know, for fatty plaques and things to form in the arteries. So we know that women who go through menopause early, people who get premature ovarian insufficiency, they've got sort of, you know, twice the risk of developing heart disease as women that go through menopause at the normal age. It's about 51 in this country. And there have been quite a lot of studies in, in recent years that have had fairly conflicting information. But what seems to be pretty well understood is that if we start HRT in women by the age of 60 or within 10 years of their last period, then they get statistically quite significant benefits um, on their heart health of being on the estrogens. Um, so, and I think, again, lots of women that I speak to, they think about their breast cancer risk first and foremost, but for a lot of women, their heart health is much more of a relevant risk factor for them as they get older. Um, so it's a good so, good thing to consider. So it's really, uh, you, you try and individualise the treatment depending on what kind of patients in front of you at the time. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And in clinic, that's what you're doing. You're sort of you're you're talking to the woman in front of you about you know what is her family history, who, who's died yeah. of what in her life, and um, we also talk about you know what's happened to them up to this point. We consider things like their body mass index, the smoking status, the, the how much alcohol they drink. I think lots of women don't understand that the risk that the the increase in risk that you get of breast cancer with HRT is the equivalent to having a glass of wine a day. I mean, the lifestyle risk oh. factors that we do all the time it's, it's just you know if your body mass index is over 30 if you had your thir first baby over the age of 30 that has the same sort of impact on your breast cancer risk as going on to HRT and I think the perception out there is that actually you know the risk of breast cancer is huge um, but I, I use a slide when I um, talk to women that, that sort of lines up all the different risk factors or the things that can happen to you as you get older. So looking at bone health and heart health and stroke and um, blood clots and all sorts of things. And if you look across all of the things that can go wrong, actually being on HRT tends to overall reduce your risk rather than increase it. So it's a, it's a decision that has to be massively individualized. Um, and you mentioned about bone health. I mean, from a bone perspective, we start to lose our bone density in our 40s. It you know, goes down by about 2.5% a year, um, continues to go down into our 50s by about a percent, 1.5% a year. And again, if we don't have estrogen, we just keep losing mass and we'll fracture and get osteoporosis and we'll develop a, you know, the, the sort of typical slightly stooped posture of osteoporosis when we get into our 70s and 80s. Yeah. And I don't think yeah. that people often consider the risks of things like that as well. So it's, it's it's such an important life stage to think seriously about how you want to manage your health, really. So really, you're, uh, you're assessing the patient at the time they're in front of you, but also the projections for future future uh, yeah. uh, life life uh, pr problems that may arise. Yeah, and I think it's like a pit stop. I think it's a shame we don't call people in, actually, mm -hmm. um, and, and have a bit of a pit stop, because I think for women it's the... The, probably the biggest transition they're going to go through that's going to have the largest impact on stuff that we I think we take for granted as women that certain things are happening or, or will happen to us as part of getting older like getting the stooped posture or you know um, developing urinary problems or getting more urine infections or sex getting more difficult and less enjoyable but it doesn't actually have, have to happen that way I think it's just that we historically yeah. haven't taken a proactive approach about you know what we want to happen to us as we get into this this sort of next stage of life. Mm -hmm. Some women are really badly affected by by, by sort of the, the vasomotor effects of you know, uh, and they can be sweating and dripping, and it's really uncomfortable. Yeah. What is the cur a current sort of approach to, to that problem um, in terms of therapy? But, um, 
I mean, the nice guidance um, if for treating menopause symptoms is HRT. It's quite clear now that if a woman is um, symptomatic, that the benefits of HRT outweigh the risks. I mean, there, there's a, a, a cohort of women that can't have HRT. Um, and there are other yep. drugs that we can use that, that will work. And we use antidepressant medications sometimes that it's not to change how they feel about having the flushes. It sort of mod modifies how the um, the messages are sent to the blood vessels to make them dilate and so on. Um, but we can use that. We can use a drug called gabapentin with, with good effect and another right. drug called clonidine. But it's really clear evidence that if you can tolerate HRT, the right thing to give you is estrogen because that's the thing okay. that is most likely. Yeah. I mean, I'm trained in CBT for menopause. That's getting quite trendy. Um, now there's quite a good evidence base for that. And that is the, the thinking behind that is that a lot of the impact is to do with um, the story and the meaning of the flushes for women. I think we get quite flustered. We get worried that people are watching us and, and questioning whether we're okay. So we can teach uh, paced breathing. We can help women to understand what's happening to them. The, um, there's a bit of your brain called the thermonuclear zone, which in that zone gets much narrower as you go through menopause um, because of the changes in your estrogen levels. So I think sometimes just explaining to women what's happening and why and teaching them techniques to help them to control it and helping them to understand that stress is well recognized as is making it worse. Um, so things that improve their general well-being and relaxation and things can help. But yeah, the, the number one treatment is to give estrogen. Okay. Now, you, you mentioned testosterone uh, earlier on, and I'm, I'm just intrigued uh, because, uh, you know, uh, at, first, at first sight, our listeners would probably think testosterone, that's surely a male hormone. Can, can you just give us a, a sort of an insight uh, uh, as to what the role of testosterone is in females for a start, and then why yeah. you may use it as part of HRT, because I, I think it's quite uh, counterintuitive. Yeah, no, it is. When, one of the things when I was in um, so we, the ESM course was in Budapest. So when I say when I was in Budapest, it's when I was doing all my sort of um, medical training bit on sexology and I remember them explaining to me that actually the average woman has more testosterone in her body than estrogen which is you know not something that I'd ever really appreciated about my my hormones and again I think conversely the average postmenopausal woman has less estrogen than a man of the same age if she's not on HRT so this myth of estrogen being a woman's hormone and testosterone being a man's hormone is not quite accurate um, yeah. So yeah, testosterone is made, um, it sort of peaks in our 20s, it's made by our adrenal glands which sit on top of our kidneys and it's made in our ovaries as well. And it's a really important um, chemical in our bodies in terms of sexual function. I mean, it does other things, it's involved in um, our, our metabolism, in our muscle mass and um, it helps our cognitive function and mood and, and things as well. But it's it's quite important from a sexual function perspective, um, partly because it's involved in dopamine release in the brain. And that's, there's sort of, there are chemicals in the body that accelerate sexual response and chemicals that stick the brakes on. So testosterone is one of the ones that's associated with the accelerators. Um, and it also helps to, uh, helps you with your genital sensitivity, with arousal, climax, and sex drive, it's part, it works in the brain to help you to fantasize and to, to, to think that sex is a good idea. So one of the problems we have is that when we're younger, most of our testosterone is made by our adrenals, but as we get older, the, the balance shifts a bit and more of it is made by the ovaries. So in women who go into a surgical menopause because they've had their ovaries taken out, they get this precipitous you know, fall off of testosterone in their body. Um, so for them, it's a really important hormone to think about replacing, particularly those of those women are younger as well. And sex obviously can be really, I mean, one of the things I'm often talking about is that sexuality is really important to older people. But I think younger women have a, um, a particularly hard time coming to terms with an acute menopause, like a surgical menopause. So it's important to consider things like their sexual function and replacing testosterone. But we do it, I, I say I do it, and, and there's a nice um, a BMS consensus statement now that helps to support women uh, in doctors in, in giving testosterone to women. And we use it when we have women who are struggling with sexual function at menopause. So generally speaking, we're supposed to give estrogen back first. Um, but if we find that that doesn't improve sexual function, then replacing with testosterone or topping up with testosterone is absolutely fine. And we don't have, in the UK, we don't have um, female forms of testosterone. We have to steal the, the bloke's gel and use it in tiny doses. 
Um, so I tend to give my patients a sachet to use and get them to use it over 10 days. And say so just to squeeze like a, a, you know, a pea sized amount out every day or to use a pump every other day. Whereas men will use a, a full sachet um, every day to sort of top up yeah. their testosterone levels. But it can. It's one of the few drugs that we've got um, that's got an evidence base for improving sexual satisfaction scores. So it's something that's really important to remember if you're struggling. Um, the, uh, I want to move on to something else because I, I, you, um, I was very grateful for the article you sent me that you'd written on on, on the vagina and, and other uh, sexology uh, aspects. The, the thing that grabbed me was the um, comment that the vagina is self-cleaning. Um, <laughs> it sounds more like an oven advert, doesn't it? Self-cleaning. Yeah. Uh, can you elaborate on that? And, and, and more importantly, what hap happens um, in, in the young and then again in, in the menopause? It's it's actually um, so my colleague, um, the, the private clinic colleague, um, Angela Sharma, is the one that says this. That the, the vagina is a, a self cleaning oven, but it's a nice way of describing how it's really ingenious. And I don't think women understand how clever the vagina is. It's it is um, ingeniously designed to support reproduction, and it means that you know it's got an excellent blood supply. It heals very quickly from um, from the trauma of childbirth or from the sort of micro trauma of sex. Um, it helps us to prevent infection and it's it's got a specialized lining, um, the vaginal mucosa, which is about 28 cells thick and the cells are, um, they're different to the cells on the outside of our body because they don't have keratin in them. So they're a bit leaky, which means that um, mm -hmm. we get this sort of this, this wetness that develops naturally called transudate, which helps the vaginal walls not to stick together. And so the yeah. top layer of the cells sloughs off every four hours or so. And, and it's full of a storage sugar. In your fertile years, it's full of a storage sugar called glycogen. And that the dead cells and the glycogen feed um, bacteria that, that live in us called lactobacillus. And, and mm -hmm. that is, it produces a chemical called lactic acid that keeps the vagina with a slightly acidic pH. It's, it's um, pH mm -hmm. is about 4.5 when you're in your fertile years. And it, it's really important because that slightly acidic pH fights off the growth of other bacteria or fungi. So it's designed this, this really sort of cleverly designed system that enables us to cope with the fact that, you know, the bowel's just around the corner. And, you know, if we're having sex and we've, and we've got our bowel emptying really nearby, there's quite a lot of possibility of infection entering the vagina. But because of the role of estrogen and, and, and the way that it works to, to make the, um, the womb like the vaginal lining work in that way, we've got this great defense against it. The problem is when we go through menopause and we don't have estrogen, we lose the glycogen in those cells. We, the the lining gets um, much less stretchy. We lose the little rugi, the little folds that are in the side of the vaginal wall. Um, they go away. So we tend to get a much narrower vagina over over time. And we often notice things like the the the, um, the smell that we have can be a bit different because the, the the group of bacteria that are living inside us has changed because the pH has gone up. Um, and I think that that is something that women don't always realize. They become aware of the fact that they just notice a difference and they can be quite sort of self-conscious about it. Um, the walls are no longer kept with that nice moisture that stops them from sticking together. So women after menopause, it can feel like a sandpapery, raw and uncomfortable or burning. Um, and again, you know, if, you, if you're gonna try and have sex, it can be a real problem because the stretch has gone. Yeah. Um, and the, the touch can feel really different as well. We, we lose some of our sensory nerves. We lose and the clitoral tissue. So the clitoris is obviously this, um, it's derived from the same bit of us that the penis is derived from in, in the unborn baby. So it's erectile yeah. tissue. And that also loses um, some of its size and some of its ability to engorge in response to, to sexual stimulus as well. So all of these, all of these things can impact and cause a problem. Now you you mentioned the 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 natural phenomenon of the vagina producing the transudate that keeps it nice and moist. Mm. What happens during arousal then? Do you do you produce more? Yes, yeah, so if you start what, with the process. So what I, I, what happens in in your fertile years is when you get aroused, your body directs a whole bunch of blood to different places. So it directs some more blood to your breasts, and your breasts will swell up and get more sensitive. And women after menopause sometimes notice that that sensitivity is gone because the blood doesn't go there anymore. And it also directs a whole bunch of blood down to the um, the vulva and the vagina. 
So mm -hmm. female erections are a bit different. We don't think of ourselves as having erections, but we, we do like men, we have this sort of erectile tissue and you need that continuous blood flow to go into it. It doesn't get trapped in it like the penis does. It, you need a continuous sort of flow of blood into it. And one of the, the things that happens with that flow of blood is the amount of transudate that we're producing, this, this leaking that happens through the vaginal wall, the volume goes up. So women become aware that they've, they've become wet. And, you know, that is something that we really associate with sexual arousal. It's something that, you know, tells your partner that you're turned on. And I think you find in postmenopausal women that that is they often complain of dryness about a third of women postmenopausally will complain that they feel dry and it's the dryness that's causing them a problem with sex and it's you know it's because the blood supply that's going into the vagina is is much less significant than it was before um, they went through menopause and so the the level of sort of um the sensation that you feel the ability of the vagina to accommodate penetration all of that can get massively impacted and then when you set up a cycle that something is uncomfortable, you then get a whole yes. bunch of other psychological things that come along with it, you know, as you'll know. So you get anxiety, adrenaline with anxiety just shuts the sexual response down really quickly. So arousal falls apart and we'll, we'll get issues with vaginismus where the muscles can get really tight. So loads of different things can happen on the back of, um, it doesn't always, obviously some people continue to have healthy functioning sex lives that they can enjoy, but it, it can become a significant problem for about half of, half of women after menopause. And uh, as, as a rule for the menopausal women that where you feel lubrication, uh, uh, lubricants might be useful, uh, what, what are your choices? There's loads. Again, whenever I, when I went on these courses, so all the courses on sexology are often overseas because there's not many of us. So you have to kind of group together in, in European countries. And every time you go to a conference, they're all apparently sponsored by lube manufacturers. So you learn a lot about lube um, and all lube is not the same. So there's water based lubes. Um, there are oil based lubricants, silicon based, hyaluronic acid based lubes. The lubricants that have got um, glycerin in them can be problematic for women because they can um, cause irritation and um, encourage candida thrush infections and things as well. So you've got to be quite careful about what's in them, what pH they are, okay. what the what osmotic, um, whether they're hyperosmolar or underosmolar, so whether they pull water in or um, push water out of the vulva. So you've got to choose your lube fairly well. But one of the most useful tips that I was taught when I did my kicks course was this principle of something called double glide. Um, so the yes, idea I saw the there article. is yeah. <laughs> so double glide um, is a really simple trick, and it is something that can make a massive difference um, to sex lives. So I don't. I'm not funded by Yes, but Yes Lubricant is the one that I tend to recommend to patients, and it um, they have an oil-based lube and they have a water-based lube. And the oil-based um, and the water-based don't mix. So we, we exploit the fact that the two of them don't mix by asking women or suggesting that women will use the oil-based one internally on themselves. And then when they come to have sex, use the water-based one on their partner. And just the fact that you've got one that's oil and one that's water means that the slipperiness right. continues. It's sort of twice as slippery. It doesn't, lots of people I think with lube notice that it goes away in the middle of sex, but with the double glide, it kind of, it stays around and it helps. Um, which brings me to, to, to the next uh, issue about um, uh, pain at intercourse. You know, uh, obviously, if, if you are menopausal, uh, you, you will have um, difficulties or oh, pain, pain at the entrance uh, of the vagina, superficial dyspareunia. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just wondering in the, in the younger age groups, what, what are the reasons for uh, having difficulty with sex? due to pain in the younger the age groups mm -hmm. do you mean premenopausal or postmenopausal yeah premenopausal yeah premenopausal so i mean so, so, there's all sorts of things that can cause superficial dyspareunia i mean you can i tend to look at it anatomically and say so if you look at the the skin yeah. first um there's all sorts of things that can go wrong with our skin. We can get eczema, dermatitis. Okay. There's a condition called lichen sclerosis, which can be really intensely mm -hmm. itchy and burny and uncomfortable. Um, so there's those sort of problems. Um, superficial dyspareunia sometimes uh, help is is describing you know the effect of things like vaginismus, that sort of muscular tension that you can feel. Um, 
So that's to do with your pelvic floor muscles, which are like a, you know, a hammock at the bottom of your pelvis, but they wrap around the vaginal entrance. And when we are yes. when we are anticipating something bad might happen to us, whether it's pain or whether it's a remembered trauma, we, we can have a really strong uh, reflex response where they can, can squeeze down and make it make it feel like there's a roadblock it can fit I, I get women coming in thinking yeah. that they don't have normal anatomy um because their assumption is they haven't got a, an entrance like other people have so that can cause a major problem um there's all sorts of issues in, in terms of sort of vulvodynia and people that will get often unexplained pain um that refers to different parts of their vulva and we get a slightly different picture in people postmenopausally because obviously we get a lot more of the the gsm type picture whether the tissues of the vulva and the vagina can get really quite thin and fragile um, and that can cause intense burning even without sex let alone with attempts at sex i'm, cu I'm curious uh, um with, with a bit uh, with, a, with a young uh, woman with vulvodynia or vulval pain um, mm. in the absence of anything to account for it i just wondered uh, from uh, from your approach to the problem as opposed to a pain consultant's approach to the problem. How do you approach these patients where all the tests have been negative mm. uh, and some uh, even have a biopsy and there's nothing to explain for the symptoms? What is your approach to this uh, kind of patient? Well, I think I mean, I'm guessing that the approach that you'll take as a, you know, as a, um, a pain consultant is you would think about all the medical approaches that I would think about in terms mm -hmm. of we we use certain painkillers and things, don't we? Some of the psychosex bits that that I've been taught to look at well would go more into expanding what we consider to be sex. I think one of the biggest things that the, the biggest myths that got busted for me when I was doing my psychosex training was this idea that all sex is penetrative sex. Um, and mm -hmm. so a lot of what we do from a psychosex perspective is to widen the definition of sex and, and talk about anything as counting as, as you know, anything that, that causes arousal counts as being some sort of sexual encounters. And so we'll often work with women using something like self-focus and sensate focus, that, which mm -hmm. are psychosexual mm -hmm. techniques. But self-focus is... We use a lovely term solo sex to talk about masturbation rather than partnered sex and solo sex. Um, and so if I was working with somebody in that way, I'd often get them to spend some time essentially exploring themselves, working out which bits feel comfortable, working out which bits do cause the pain, working out, focusing on the on the touch from a in a mindful way. So you're, you're sort of looking at pressure and temperature and the aim of the exercise isn't often to get aroused, it's just learning your anatomy. And, and, and the reason for doing that is that, you know, I'm, I'm teaching you to suck eggs, but pain is a really total concept, isn't it? Part of pain is to do with what's actually happening in terms of tissue damage or something that's going wrong. But a lot of it is to do with its meaning to us and our anticipation of it and our, our fearfulness of it and what it means in our lives yeah. and so on. So we often go at it from that perspective. Um, in almost sort of ripping everything up and starting from scratch, what feels okay, what doesn't feel okay, what am I all right doing on my own, what am I okay doing with my partner? We sometimes use adjuncts like lidocaine gel, so local anaesthetic jelly and things mm -hmm. can sometimes be quite useful yeah. to help if you've got pain around um, the entrance and so on. But it's so individualized, women all have, with vulvodynia, there's all sorts of underlying um, issues that might be going on. Do you, do you ever uh, go to work and come out of, uh, after a day's hard work being surprised by what a patient comes to you with? Yeah, I mean, I, I seem to have a knack now of bringing sex into conversations that you wouldn't. I know I start to worry about myself <laughs> because I, um, I, find, I find it everywhere. Um, I do, but I think when I did it, I wasn't really sure why I was doing it as a, as a, a course apart from personal interest. And actually... I now feel very differently that, you know, our sexuality, most of us, it is a really core part of our identity. Um, and I, I find patients are really grateful that I have asked them about something that is important to them and important in their relationships. Um, 
and something that none of us get taught a great deal about. We get sex ed at school mm. and then nobody really tells us anything after that point. And no one gives sex yeah. ed to women going through menopause um, and they really need it. But it's not just women. It, I mean, I swear and I see guys that um, have had a stroke or have had prostate issues or have got, um, you know, hypertension and they're on drugs that can affect their sexual function. There's loads of drugs that we prescribe constantly as doctors um, without realising the effect it's having. Now, what is the reaction of the patients when you when you uh, bring the the, uh, the sexual factors in, the, in their health? <laughs> there what's, is usually what's the reaction? I'm curious. <laughs> There is context to it. I'm not just sort of flying in there with, <laughs> without it having any no, context. No, I, I didn't, I didn't um, that. No. Well, you, I think you've got to demonstrate your own comfort with it. I think most people are really grateful. I think if I go into it quite factually and I will, I don't know, antidepressants often have a side effect of um, impacting sexual mm -hmm. function. We, we use antidepressants frequently. We use it in menopause for flushes. We use it obviously for depression and anxiety, but for pain, obviously, we use it quite a lot. And, and I will just say to patients, look, often people don't explain that you can get problems with sexual function. If if we put you on an antidepressant, it's a, it will change the way that the chemicals in your body work. And often it can make climax take much longer. It can sometimes make it impossible to achieve. And if I just explain something to, to a patient in a fairly sort of factual, um, comfortable way, I tend to find they're fine with it, actually. And it, it, because I've made it OK, it's they feel that it's going to be okay whatever I say to them and it's astonishing quite how much you end up talking about it and, and how many things can impact on your sexual function you know there's a huge number of things that will impact on it. We've talked a little bit of, uh, about uh, loss of arousal I just want to go to the other extreme um, with the uh, uh, women with the persistent gentle arousal disorder is it a very common mm. problem? I haven't seen it in my practice. I, I learned about it um, when I was overseas right. and we had, you know, um, lectures about it. That There's an association, we think, with SSRI use, but we don't fully understand mm -hmm. it. There's a chap called um, yeah. KB Reisman who used to be the president of the ESSM who's done quite a lot of papers and, and research into it. Um, so it's something that I, I've, I think... Uh, I've read about more than I've actually seen in patients, but it's quite a disabling right. condition. It, it can be, be extremely yeah, distressing. I've seen a few yeah. patients, but yeah. But it's interesting that there can also be a side effect of, of the drugs. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's fully understood. I think uh, so Dr. Reisman mm. is doing quite a lot of work um, around sexual function after SSRIs anyway. Um, I think there's, you know, there's mm. quite a few papers that have been published over the last couple of years about persistent sexual dysfunction um, after even short term use of um, antidepressant drugs. So, again, mm. I think it's just something that people need to understand a little bit more about when they're being put onto the medications that, that we, we give them. Uh, finally, I just wanted to uh, really, because we're the Valval Pain Society, um, uh, from your specialist perspective, what general advice would you give to a woman uh, with reference to good vulval, good vaginal care? What are, what are your, what are your so I think uh, it changes. recommendations? I think it changes slightly as you go through menopause. So I think, you know, before menopause, okay. leave, leave yeah. it to do its thing is probably my best advice, actually. So for most people okay. with um, with a functioning vulva um, you know, that, that's not sort of complaining in any way, um, just don't strip it of its natural oils. Don't give it harsh soaps. Don't give it loads of fragrances that it doesn't need. We've got this obsession in our society with needing to kind of potpourri and fragrance our bits and we and they don't need that they you know it works perfectly well without it so um just gentle washing and emollients and things i think are fine but after you go through menopause it, it, you've got to step it up a little bit and probably add in regular moisturizing um which is there are specific vaginal moisturizers so again um, yes brand has one but there are lots of other brands that are available and they help quite a lot to trap moisture in I think you need to be quite careful. Hair removal is quite a big trend these days and it's fine. But yeah. again, after menopause, when the skin is a little bit more sensitive, you might want to consider trimming rather than shaving or um, certainly be quite careful about the, the micro trauma, the little cuts and things that can be caused by doing that. Um, mm -hmm. So and it's a case of just making sure that you are um, not putting harsh chemicals 
on the vulva so anything that I, th mm -hmm. I think we can become if we think we've got a funny smell so when you go through menopause and your your biome you know the, the, the um, bacteria and, and so on that live inside have changed you can become quite sensitive and worried about it and start to overwash and, and contribute to the yeah. problem so um, I think there's a lot of myth around the need to sort of freshen the vagina up and actually it really does need looking after with emollients and creams it needs um, checking as well as you get older because for a small proportion of women, when, when you're postmenopausal, a condition called lichen sclerosis can show up, which is sort of white patches and um, the vagina, the lips can almost sort of shrink away a little bit and it can become intensely itchy. Um, and small, really small percentages of those will go on to develop vulval cancers. So again, I think a principle of looking after yourself and you check your breasts, but it's also quite a good idea to check your vulva um, and make sure that it looks healthy. There's no lumpy areas or ulcerated areas. Do many of your patients um, need to uh, be told to uh, examine their vulva? Yeah, I don't think that women as a whole think to do that very much anyway. I think we're not we're not particularly good, um, I think, in the UK in general, actually, about being OK with our bodies, really. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that most women don't most women that I come across don't spend hours checking themselves. But if I'm seeing a woman at menopause and I'm doing a vaginal examination, I'll often mention to them that it's quite important to keep an eye, especially if they've got itch. Um, because I think we've got a tendency as women having had fertile years where the itch is often something like thrush that we can sort out ourselves over the counter. Um, to dismiss it as that or to keep treating it in that way and not spot that something else is going on. So it's just about raising awareness. If no one tells you that something can happen, then you don't know to look for it. So just being aware that um, that this can happen and, and, and that a little bit of a check every so often is quite a good idea. It's definitely worth doing. Okay, well, I, I've, I've really enjoyed the, the, the hour. The hour has gone really uh, quickly, but uh, <laughs> tell us something about yourself that you've not told anyone. God. Um, I have no idea. I mean, most of my time at the moment is, is swept up with, I'm, I'm spending most of my time swept up with um, my colleagues setting up our, our clinic, really. So that's probably the most, I'm, I'm quite nervous about doing that, but quite excited about doing it. Um, well, we'll wish you all the best. My biggest and, challenge. And well, wish you all the, uh, the best in your uh, clinic. And, uh, and we look forward to having you again on uh, our webinars very soon. Thank you very much, Angela. Oh, I'm just going to hand over to Sharon just in case there are any questions from the listeners. Oh, I can't hear you, Sharon. Uh, here we go. Uh, Unmuting mute. myself would work. It? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like I've, I've not done this before. <laughs> um, Angela, that was absolutely fascinating. We've had floods of comments coming in saying thank you why weren't we taught this before why don't we know this information that was the best information ever really it was absolutely fascinating and information packed and I think I certainly will have to go back and re-watch this because there are so many nuggets in there um, we have a few questions that have come in um so let's have a look. Um, how long does oestrogen take to provide vulvovaginal relief? And is Mona Lisa Touch a good treatment? So um, two bits to that, isn't there? So um, yeah. oestrogen usually, if you're using, we normally start people using it nightly for two weeks and then drop them down to twice weekly. I often give them nightly for a bit longer, actually. Um, but usually six to eight weeks to, to see an improvement. Yeah. And then the Mona Lisa is new or relatively new. So these are vaginal lasers um, and they're only available privately at the moment. And there's some sort of preliminary research that shows that they can be really useful. So women who've gone through a breast cancer are on drugs like um, aromatase inhibitors that, that get rid of all of their oestrogen really are about the only group that can't have vaginal oestrogens very easily. And it's it, they struggle often, I think, with sexual function. Um, they've often gone through, you know, surgery that's changed their body image and it's quite important to them um, you know, to offer them something that's a solution. And the vaginal lasers are being used increasingly for that with some quite good results. We just haven't got any big um, trial results back in. I'm aware of one trial in London that's being done. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, all right. We've got pain in vulval skin that's worse when sitting. Can systemic HRT help when topical hasn't? They work together so that 
systemic HRT doesn't always deliver enough estrogen to the urogenital tissues. So um, I suppose especially with the work that I do, I tend to, to think of using both rather than just one. Um, if you deliver the estrogen locally, then obviously it's going to get incorporated into the cells much more easily. And there's more than just estrogen. There's um, DH, there's this prosterone, which is DHEA, mm. which is like the building block of um, estrogen and, and testosterone. So there's a couple of new treatments that can be considered if you've not managed with vaginal estrogens before. Yeah. Um, someone has asked, where can I find someone to talk to as knowledgeable as Angela in Sheffield, please? <laughs> I don't I don't think there's many this is the reason why we're setting up a clinic so we're, we're, we're going live in summer we'll be online and we'll be we've got a funny name but it's Spiced Pair Health so that will exist soon until then there aren't many of us there's menopause specialists you can get hold of a menopause specialist through um, the British Menopause Society they keep a list mm -hmm. sexologists there are psychosexual counsellors um, through the COSRAT, um list that's that's one way to, to get that help but people that do all of it, there's there's about, as I say, about 50 of us um, in the UK that are ESSM trained and not many of those have the psychosex and the menopause. So yeah. I've, I've done an unusual bunch of training. Yes. Um, <laughs> Angela Sharma is your colleague. Yes. Is that right? And she's, yeah. she, she's, uh, she's been watching along. Um, the self-cleaning oven is going to be with me <laughs> that's, for a while. Yeah, uh, that's, that's very <laughs> much her catchphrase. <laughs> I think it's a lovely way of putting it. Um, what else have we got? We've got, what are symptoms of menopause in the younger women? They're very similar because they're the symptoms of estrogen deficiency. So it's it's there's a huge long list. I think someone's counted at sort of 38. There's other people that say there's more symptoms than that. Your estrogen receptors go through your entire body. They're in your nervous system. They affect your, your neurotransmitters, the, the way that chemicals in your body talk to each other. Um, so you can get joint aches, you can get hot flushes, you can get brain fog, mood change, sleep disturbance, urinary symptoms, sex drive problems, itch. I mean, it, it's an endless, endless list, um, which is why it's, why it's so important. I think if you, you know if you don't get, know this is going to happen to you and you get felled by it, especially if you're a younger woman, um, it's you know really significant impact. Mm. Yeah. Um, just looking through to see if there's any others uh, reference from the paper uh you mentioned that you wrote angela could we have uh, okay. the, the reference to that so we could pop yeah, that up in the comments there's a um there's one that went into this year uh, this month's edition of um her life her health it was just about how to talk to women in in menopause about sex um so that's done by the primary care women's health forum I'm, I'm speaking with them in their Congress this year um, about sex and menopause. Okay, and is that easily accessible online? Yeah, if you go up? to the, um, it's on the Primary Care Women Health, I can't say the words, Primary Care Women's Health Forum website, and actually it's free access. So um, if okay. you go and look at the most recent um, issue in, and flick through, it's in there. I'm doing a series Brilliant. with them on different stages of life. So I'm doing it with um, childbearing years, um, golden years, so can after cancer, after illness and things as well. Okay, uh, just uh, one more, time for one more, I think. Um, if you thought you could be experiencing early menopause, do GPs test hormones? How is it diagnosed? Um, they definitely should for early menopause. Um, we don't do blood tests so much if you're over 45, actually. If you've got the symptoms, we know it probably is that. But you would need your FSH level testing if you were um, under 45 and probably would have symptoms that might make us want to check other things as well to make sure it's not your thyroid or anything else that's causing a problem. Yeah. OK, brilliant. Angela, that was super informative. And I think, you know, the questions will keep on coming, but we do have to uh, bring it to a stop and perhaps, you know, bring you on again in the future. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be happy to, yeah. For a, for a part two. Um, Winston, what was your biggest takeaway from what Angela shared today? Well, I, I think my biggest... Uh, uh, learning point was the importance of HRT and in particular <laughs> the, the use of testosterone. I, I vaguely knew about it but uh, as, as, as a non-specialist in that area um, I, I think I've, I've got a better understanding uh, about it so I think if I was asked by mm -hmm. a patient um, A I would know what to say uh, with confidence 
but B, know who I can send that patient to. I think that that was the probably the most important <laughs> thing. A, a lot of it is cutting through, uh, uh, cu cutting corners and getting the right pa pa patient to the right person at the right time. And I yeah, think Angela's yeah. just uh, broadened the the possibilities for our women. Full stop. So mm -hmm. I, I so I'm quite excited about uh, even though they may only be 54. Who cares? We've got the most important person in front of us. So we know who to refer to. So that's yeah. my biggest uh, uh, benefit from listening today, really. It's just mm -hmm. awareness that there is expertise out there. And it's mm -hmm. just uh, important to signpost uh, where these people can be contacted. And uh, it's a win-win situation. Mm, absolutely. Um, and it's lovely to hear this holistic approach again. Mm. Um, absolutely, the biopsychosocial model and a personalised approach. It's so, so important to treat the whole person. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Angela Wright, thank you so much again for your time. Winston, thank you um, for having that conversation as well. So I could just sit in the background and listen <laughs> and be in the comments box. It was brilliant. Um, let me tell you, everyone who's watching, uh, what we have coming up next time. There is a growing body of evidence of a link between the gut microbiome, the variety and mix of the good and bad bacteria in the gut, and persisting pain. So 7 p.m. on the 26th of May, we have Dr. Siobhan O'Mahony, senior lecturer and researcher of the microbiome gut-brain axis, uh, maternal gut health, stress and pain in University College Cork. Really excited to be having Dr. O'Mahony with us for that. Um, Remember all of our live streams, including this one, because I'll certainly be re-watching this one <laughs> to pick up on those brilliant nuggets. All of our live streams and a number of webinars and podcasts are there for you to access via our YouTube channel to which you can subscribe. So um, each time that we add a video, you'll be notified. You can no, uh, email us at info at vulvalpainsociety.org or connect with us on social media. We're on Twitter or Facebook. We'll probably start doing something with Instagram soon. Any of you out there who are experts in Insta and are keen to help us, get in touch. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the meantime, follow us on Twitter or Facebook to be kept up to date. We hope you can join us next time. 7 p.m. 26th of May with Dr. Siobhan O'Mahony for what I predict is going to be a bit of an eye-opening conversation on pain and the microbiome. That's all from the Volvo Pain Society today. Thank you again, Dr. Angela Wright. Thank and you. And thank you, Winston DeMello. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for being with us, whether you're watching it live or on the replay. Bye for now. See you next time. Cheerio. Bye. Bye.